Before I even get into my presentation, I'm going to read a statement from our graphics team. The first two slides are created by Jessica herself, and no bad light should shine on the Thought Exchange uh, creative team. <laughs> so it's really cool that there's so many people here. Usually when I put the research into the session description, people are just like, this is going to be super dry. I would rather listen to someone talk about their anecdotes of working at like four companies. So uh, I'm super excited. You guys seem to be my crowd. So what we're going to do today is that we're going to talk about uh, how to balance efficiency and innovation, what roles data teams can play in that towards the rest of the company, but also how data teams can figure that balance out themselves within their teams. Uh, before we do that, though, I want to do a little bit of a disclosure to tell you where my biases in interpreting this data might come from and where any, any anecdotes that I might bring up were, they, were the companies that I worked at. So I spent the most of my career in pretty disruptive high-tech companies. I was five years with a uh, with, uh, uh, social media analytics and media monitoring company called Meltwater. I was a couple of years at Google as head of business development for the Nordic countries. I'm originally from Sweden, if you hear a little bit of an accent. Uh, Green tech is one of my biggest private passions. So I sit on the board and I've invested in a couple of green tech companies that are trying to disrupt the utility space. And after a few years in these pretty disruptive companies, I was starting to like think, what is it that makes it possible for some companies to disrupt, whereas other companies seem to be disrupted? And I spent so much time thinking about this that at some point, like, I need to do something about this. Like, I can't just sit here and wonder about these things. So I decided, a pretty bold move, to leave my pretty cushy job at Google and go work at a company that was primed for disruption. It was a 60-year-old Swedish company that had like 40 years of profits and then 20 years of absolute decline. So they existed for 40 years before, 40 years before Google even existed. And at the same time, I also decided that I wanted to go back into academia. So I also wanted to do some research. So at the same time, I went and did a two-year research program, and I also worked in parallel at this company, Prime for Disruption. So that company is called STS, and for local Swedes, it's one of our most well-known brands. For you guys that are not local Swedes, you probably know companies like IKEA and Volvo and Spotify way better than you know this brand. But if you ask local Swede, everyone knows what this is. So it's a very high-profile company that was about to go bankrupt. When I went back into academia, I started researching innovation. So I studied, I followed uh, agile software development teams for nine months to look at things like, is there a correlation between you know, the level of on-job autonomy and innovative behaviors, for example. Uh, and we did a pretty amazing digital transformation journey at SDS that gave us a path back to profitability. And earlier this year, uh, I, was, uh, I was named Sweden's most innovative leader, much due to the work that we did at SDS, and more or less this, you know, the work that we did to save that company. So top of the world, CDO at this big company in 30 countries, and then it was time to go back into high tech and do some disruption again. So since about a year, uh, I'm at a company called Thought Exchange, and our mission is to disrupt leadership. So how do you need to lead in order to change our companies. If we want to change how our companies operate, then we need to change how we lead. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I learned during those years in research and also during, uh, across the companies that I worked at. It turns out that in order for, uh, there are two things that companies need to do. They need to figure out how to make money today and they need to figure out how to make money in the future. That's, like, that's more or less how easy it is. So during exploitation, companies use their existing knowledge to get better at what they're currently already doing. They're driving efficiencies. And during exploration, companies seek new knowledge to try to figure out how can they create disruptive products and services, find new customers, enter into new markets, and do things that they don't know how to do? So they're seeking new knowledge. And the successful balancing of these two, so you know, current viability with future viability, is referred to as organizational ambidexterity. And 
organizational and dexterity has been tied to things like um, technological innovation, it's been tied to organizational learning, it's been tied to um, organizational survival, more or less. So when we look at organizational ambidexterity, we talk about two categories of ambidexterity. We talk about structural ambidexterity, and we talk about contextual ambidexterity. And structural ambidexterity is the choices between exploitation or exploration-oriented activities on an organizational level, how we balance exploration and exploitation on an organizational level. Whereas contextual ambidexterity are the choices by individuals between these exploration or exploitation-oriented activities in their daily work. So I guess it's pretty easy then, right? We just need to you know, do some amount of these two and some dynamic balancing, and our companies will be amazing and survive and disrupt and you know, respond to the disru disruption of all these things. But I guess it's not this easy, because if it was, everyone would do it. So, if you ask researchers, like, what this balance look like, the answer would be that you need to do enough exploitation to ensure your current viability, and enough exploration to ensure your future viability. It's not super clear advice. Uh, enough seems to be like a pretty vague term, like how do you know what enough is, right? And it gets even harder because there's actually some bias at work here. Because this is what usually happens in organizations. Like even organizations that are pretty good, like that score pretty high on the ambidexterity scale, are usually much better at exploitation than exploration. And a lot of this has historical roots. There seems to be an efficiency bias or an efficiency creep in organizational today, both on an, an organizational and on an individual level. When we're given a choice, we will choose efficiency. So this, this creeps into every single part in the organization. And as I said before, this has some historical explanations. For a very, very long time, exploitation was more or less what you needed both to be successful today and in the future, because it has to do with the rate of change, right? If things aren't changing very much, current viability is going to be very similar to future viability. So a lot of organizations have, even over time, started believing that they're innovating when really all they're doing is exploiting based on their existing knowledge. So we see this a lot in, for example, digital transformation. You implement a whole lot, you know, a tons of new technology into your organization, and you're starting talking about being innovative because now you all have all these digital tools. A lot of digital transformation, or digitization at least, has to do with automation, you know, doing things more efficiently, and all of those things, right? So there's this inherent bias, and this is a muscle we know how to use. It's like the same thing as those, like, biceps you work out all the time. It's like the only muscle you work out when you go to the gym, if you ever go to the gym. Uh, so you know how to use it, right? So it's not so, it's not so weird that this is the muscle that we use the most, because it's one that we've trained for a long time. One thing that's very, very important about efficiency is its definition. So when we're efficient, we're taking the company's resources and our own resources, and we're using them well without wasting anything. It's the definition of efficiency. So that sounds pretty good, though, right? Like, to not waste company resources. I don't think that anyone wants to be known as the person like, oh, that's Joe, like, he wastes all the company resources. Like, you don't want to be Joe. So I guess there's like, what's the problem here, then? Well, there's only one thing that's been proven to cause innovation to happen in organizations, and that's something called Slack. So I'm going to give you, like, 10, 15 seconds to read this. Let's 
So efficiency is not wasting any resources. And slack, a resource in excess of any resources you need to get your job done. Like, it sounds, sounds like the same thing. So depending on how you look at it, it's either waste or it's slack. If you're trying to be efficient, it's waste. If you're trying to be innovative, it could be slack. And this is really what's the, at the core of why it's so difficult to find organizational ambidexterity, especially with that efficiency bias in place. It gets even more complicated when you dig into the fact that the relationship between slack and innovation is not linear. It's not that if you have an enormous amount of slack, you get automatically an enormous amount of innovation. It seems like if you have too much slack, it triggers complacency and hinders innovation because of it. And if you don't have enough slack, it hinders innovation because any initiative that doesn't have some immediate obvious business impact gets shut down. If it doesn't have a clear outcome, it gets shut down. So I guess that right now, a lot of you are like sitting there and you're like, huh, OK, I just need to go back to my company and find that sweet spot. I just need to like figure out that thing there where those two graphs met, and then I'll be the company hero, and you know, we'll ensure our company's future survival. And that's great. Because in order to find that sweet spot, it requires experimentation. It requires data. It requires people being interested in looking at the biases that we have and figuring out how to mitigate them so that we make the good decisions within our companies. So to find that dynamic balancing, we need teams like you guys. So I'm going to give you a couple of like, more tangible things to work with on the way here. A lot of people think, when they think about Slack, they think about time, because that's the most common uh, piece of Slack that people can relate to. It's like, I need more time, right? But there's actually tons of other resources that could be considered as Slack. For example, I'm going to go through four. So technological Slack, knowledge Slack, support personnel Slack, and time Slack. So technological Slack is defined as the cushion of technical functionalities given to an organizational user that goes beyond the certain functionality that's necessary for doing his or her job. So you have a set of tools that you work with on a daily basis, or a set, you know, a tech stack or whatever it might be, that you need to get your job done. If you have a bit more than that, it's likely, you're more likely to be innovative than if you have exactly what, we, what you need to get your job done. Which means, let's say, you give a front-end developer back-end tools, you give a back-end developer front-end tools, you, give, you have a little bit more of a like, powerful computer than you might need to just get the job done, it increases your chances to be innovative. And it sounds super expensive. See, if you're trying to be efficient, you probably just want to give everyone exactly what they need, because that's, that's not wasting anything, right? Knowledge Slack. This is one of my personal favorites. So it's defined as the degree to which user knowledge goes beyond the step-by-step -step procedural knowledge necessary to be followed to do his or her job. Has anyone been in a recruitment process where the term overqualified has been thrown around? Hand up. OK. I would say most people that's been in recruitment processes have at some point heard the word overqualified. It sounds super expensive to pay for more knowledge than you need. This person that knows way more than that's required to do the job you're trying to hire for it's probably going to ask for a way higher salary. And you're like, I'm not going to pay for that, because I just need this. Turns out knowledge can work as slack. If you know a bit more than the minimum requirements for doing the job, you can actually use that leftover slack to innovate. And that's been proven in research. So think about that the next time you sit in a recruitment process or hiring process. And it could probably help address some of the some of the age bias and some of like the, um, uh, the discrimination that we see in the workplace as well, but that's a completely different talk. Support personnel Slack. 
conceptualize that the cushion of personal support personnel surrounding and organizational users that are beyond what's optimally necessary for a user for doing his or her job. So this has been proven to be a very influential factor in, in um, digital innovation or innovating with, uh, uh, with information technology. If people that are working out in the business lines have more than the minimum requirement of support, for example, from their IT department, they're more likely to be able to innovative with information technology and di digital tools. Again, this is not a linear relationship between these two things, though. So this is not a justification for all of you to go back and be like, I need an IT person attached to my hip to help me when that spinning ball of death starts going on my Mac. So probably you know, not, not an endless amount of IT support for everyone. Time slack. This is probably the most intuitive one. So defined as the user's cushion of time for doing his or her job that's beyond what's optimally necessary for achieving it. And the reason why this one is so intuitive is because you probably need this one in combination with some of the others to actually be able to make use of them. So in order to make use of your knowledge slack or your technology slack, you probably also need a bit of time slack, right? OK. This is like when everyone is starting to be super tired and looking at their phones. So I'm actually going to give you the opportunity to look at your phones. Because what I'm going to do right now is the most dangerous thing you can do as a presenter. I'm going to ask you to bring out your phones. We're going to do a little exercise. Because one of the things I'm looking to learn from you is some of learning a little bit about some of the behaviors that we could use to identify when we're showing efficiency bias. So, and uh, together with Looker, I'm going to create a webinar to follow up on some of these behaviors and see if we can find together find ways to address them. So you need to do three things. Either scan the QR code if you have like a phone that works that way. Or you can just go to thoughtexchange.com slash join. You enter this nine-digit code. And then the first thing you're going to be asked to do is to respond this, to this question. What sorts of things do you do when you're influenced by efficiency bias? An open-ended question. You can answer in any way you want. So add one or two thoughts on this thinking about your day-to-day -day and your own behaviors. And once you've typed in a thought, something magical is going to happen. So if you don't type in a thought, you won't get to see it. So the magic is that after you typed in your thought, you go to the next step, and you're going to be exposed to ideas from the rest of the collective intelligence in this room. And then you're going to rate those thoughts of other people depending on how much you agree that this is a behavior that you show when you're influenced by efficiency bias. So try to rate, in order for us to get good data to work with as we're going to follow up with this in a webinar afterwards, try to rate like 20 or 30 thoughts. I'm going to do some rating too. And once you've rated like 20 or 30 or so thoughts, and if you want to see what the collective intelligence are starting to come up with here, you can go to the last step that's called discover. And then you're going to be able to tap in and see what's, what's going on in everyone's minds at the moment. How many people have starred more than 20 thoughts? OK, a few people. 
Usually, we, when we talk about the usage in our product, we have like these people we would call like superstars. <laughs> They're power users. They like never stop until they've started every single thought that's available. So what I think will be super interesting with this, as we address this in, in another session, is that in order for to be able to change a bias, anyone who's worked in bias knows that there's tons of different bias in research. You have all these confirmation biases, you have recency biases, like you have all the things that's going on for you as you try to go from data to analytics to insights. And if we can learn as an analyst in a data community to identify like triggers and behaviors that we showcase when we have efficiency bias, I think that we can help tip that scale for our companies. So what I'm going to do now is that since I gave you this pleasure of being on your phones, I'm going to now ask you to not use your phones <laughs> for a little while, and I'm going to wrap up the session. And I'm going to show you some really interesting insights, because we haven't gotten to the best parts yet. Because now we're going to talk a little bit about you guys as a community. Slack for the data-driven organization. So what can we do then? to address this. And if we think about data as one of the most important resources as we, uh, that we have, we should be able to think about data as a resource, right? So if we start thinking about how we're organized, and we think back to the structural ambidexterity and the contextual ambidexterity, and we think about how data professionals are organized. So structural ambidexterity is about, for example, creating innovation labs. So Innovation Labs, is as, uh, for the, those of you that were at the Forrester presentation er, earlier today, one very common thing to do in, in our quest to become, like to reach structural ambidexterity, is to take some people and put them in an innovation lab or department and shield them from like, the efficiency of the rest of the organization. Right? The problem is, though, that these often get shut down because they're not proving immediate business impact. And I'm sure that some people in this room has probably been a part of shutting these innovation labs down, because the analysis showed that it didn't make sense for your current business. And that's efficiency bias, if there ever is one, in the structural ambidexterity side. On the contextual side, as individuals, when you're allocating your time between Explo exploitation activities and exploration activities. You need to be aware of this, that you have an efficiency bias also when you allocate your resources yourself between those two activities. A lot of companies are trying to put Slack strategies into place. And the most well-known one is Google's 20% time. 20% of your time is allocated not working on any of the things you do in your normal work. It's based you work on something else. We don't 100% care what it is, but work on that. That is a Slack strategy to try to carve out time under context, in, in a request to, to create contextual ambidexterity for people. So one of the things that I saw at Google is actually back to this efficiency bias. I saw tons of people that tried to work on their normal jobs during their Slack time. <laughs> so even when given the time, People don't do it. And the reason is because you're probably not getting paid for it. You're probably not getting promoted for it. But if you get really, really good at the job you're doing, you might get paid more, and you might get promoted, and you might cl climb the corporate ladder. So this is why we need to think about both structural ambidexterity. How are we structured as a company to make sure that people get, like, when they're given this space under the contextual ambidexterity, that they actually take advantage of it? I mentioned in the beginning that I spent a long time researching agile software development teams. And when you ask them, how much job autonomy do you have? They're like 10. 10 out of 10. I'm so autonomous. So if you had an innovative idea and you wanted to pursue it, like, could you do that? Yeah, 10 out of 10, I could do that. Do you do that? No. No, I don't do that. You're like, what? You know, because that doesn't get the things done that I need to get done. And this is why Slack strategies are so important, right? Because you need to create a culture where that's possible. So considering then 
data as Slack, I think that we can think of not just the data professionals, but also the data itself as a type of resource, right? You know, you see it all over. Data is like the most valuable resource, resource since oil. So how about data as Slack? How about the access to data? Do you get exactly what you need on time to do your job? Or is it like more than you need? Because what if you find something that's super interesting? And how do you make those decisions? Again, it's not a linear relationship. It's not that all the data to everyone will give you the maximum amount of innovation. It's about finding the sweet spot and finding good examples of when you give maybe a little bit more than the minimum requirements for doing the job, what could happen. So I'll take a, an, an anecdotal example. At Thought Exchange, we're pretty transparent with a, with a lot of things uh, under, you know, of course, privacy and security regulations. We follow those and follow the law. One type of data that we're pretty generous with is how our customer use our product. As an individual developer, a software developer, that might be completely unnecessary to write the lines of code that you need to write to get the job done. But if granted Slack time and some data Slack, you could probably figure out a way to take the product in a completely different direction that no one else thought about, right? So it's a combination of these resources that makes it possible for almost anyone in the organization to pursue innovation. So now I did a little bit of an experiment to like finish off this presentation. So I took those definitions that I had in the beginning, and I played a little bit with them. So how about data technology Slack? The cushion of data functionality given to an organizational user that goes beyond the certain data functionality that's necessary for doing his or her job. Looker licenses for everyone. Now they need to invite me next year, too. <laughs> data knowledge Slack. The degree to which user data knowledge goes beyond the step-by-step -step procedural data knowledge necessary to be followed to do his or her job. What if everyone in the, if this is our most important resource, what if everyone in the organization, regardless of where they worked, were just slightly overqualified? Not so overqualified that they, you know, they, you know, your company go, would go bankrupt today because you couldn't find your current viability. But how about they were just slightly overqualified within the resource that's the most valuable one to you? Data support personnel slack. The cushion of data support personnel surrounding an organizational user that's beyond what's optimally necessary by a user for doing his or her job. That's some of you guys. What if there were more of you to support every user in the business? Like, just a little bit more than what's the minimum requirement for do them doing their job. Would that potentially trigger some innovation? Yeah, it would be a little bit more expensive right here and now, but what could happen, right? And data time slack. Imagine this. The cushion of time for doing your job with data that is beyond what's optimally necessary for achieving it. OK. My time is zero, so I'm going to summarize. Treat efficiency bias like any other research bias. You have tons of methods available to you to make sure that you're not affected by bias when you analyze data, when you work with data. Treat this bias the same. Be aware of both structural and contextual ambidexterities on this quest to uh, get your way to that sweet spot of what works for you. And then this last ex exercise that we did, explore how treating data professionals and the data itself, as slaps, slack, uh, types of Slack resources available for other teams, how that can impact innovation. Thanks.